Steve and me back again with another Bullseye Guy podcast coming to you from Malta. So I don't have the production capabilities and value that, that Jeff does on the lighting and the audio, but we may do because the opportunity to speak to Jeff, I couldn't pass it up. I left Akon and Nolan Bushnell and a bunch of luminaries to rush out for the opportunity to, to spend it with Jeff. So super excited to, to have this opportunity, Mr. Hoffman. Big fan of yours, known you for years. This is one of the first chances I really get to talk to you in depth. Usually there's a line of people, you know, fans and everybody else there. And it's uh, us little people are standing there wanting to talk to you. So thank you so much for taking the time and, and give us an introduction. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm glad we finally found the time to do this together with uh, both of our travel schedules. Yeah. So where are you coming from now? Where are we catching you? And Sure. So uh, I just got back from a trip and it's nice that international travel has started again um, uh, with just uh, uh, a, a trip to North Africa in Morocco and then uh, up to Lisbon uh, to speak at uh, the Web Summit uh, conference yeah. there, which had about 40,000 people at it. But it was a great event. And then I had to give a talk. I had to give a talk. Listen, I had to give a talk in the Bahamas. It was such horrible duty. Um, uh, and I just got back to the U.S. in time to join you here. Perfect. Well, let's do this, Jeff. Let's back up to the history of Jeff. Talk to us about sure. the entrepreneurial side of where you are, where you got started. Absolutely. So, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's funny, Stephen, because I never used the word entrepreneur growing up. Back, when, back then, if you said you were an entrepreneur, people would wink and say, oh, you're a hustler, man. Yeah. And I'd be like, no, I'm not doing something illegal, right? I'm not running drugs. I'm just building companies. And people would say, well, you just couldn't find a job. Uh, people didn't accept an entrepreneur was a career choice. In fact, it's funny that it was, it took a lot of years till the first time a school called me and said, would you speak at career day? And I was like, yeah, I don't really have one of those. And yeah. they said, no, no, no. We think that you're an entrepreneur on purpose. All these years later, they decided that was a career. So I'm a software engineer by trade. That's my degree. Uh, I went to a university I could not afford. Uh, and so I funded it. I got kicked out the first day. I funded my college education by starting a little software company. I left and got a corporate engineering job, but I hated it. I couldn't do the corporate lifestyle. I quit. And I've been doing startups ever since. My, I'll just say it, tell you quickly, my first startup ever was the, uh, when you go to an airport and you check in and those check-in kiosks that are in the airports around the world, that was my first product. Um, and fortunately, my first company uh, did work. It was successful. We sold those kiosks, airports everywhere, and then we sold the whole company. Um, I've been doing startups ever since. Uh, the biggest ones I was part of were Priceline.com, which a lot of people know as Booking.com, same company. Uh, we had another company called Ubid.com that, that became one of the world's biggest online auction sites. Those are both companies that went public and uh, turned into multi-billion dollar companies over time. Last thing was I have done some stuff outside of tech. I started, uh, I've always been fascinated by the media business and I started a music company um, that we did tours, we did concerts. Uh, <laughs> we produced one album that happened to win a Grammy for best jazz album, so we won't try that again. Wow, um, very cool. And we've... Uh, started producing television, which we're still doing. We have a brand new show about to come out called Going Public. Um, and we did uh, some feature film production. So I've spent time in media outside of tech. Uh, but all of these have been one consistent thing. They've been startups that we built and did our best to grow. So I'm fascinated in, in learning something about you. I knew the Priceline story that we'll move into. Talk to me about you, Ben. I, I know Greg. Oh, yeah. Jump. I know Greg from day one at UBIT in Chicago. How did you end up there and, and what was Yeah, the... so obviously, uh, you know, Greg was a, a very, played a very integral role, Greg and Tim. Uh, uh, but um, they're the ones who reached out to me and told me about the idea. Um, so I came in as CEO. We expanded the platform. Um, you know, obviously, we took the company public. We added other business lines, uh, a wholesale business, a B2B business. Um, during the time that I was running the company. So when we uh, added a, another company then called redtag.com, and then eventually, even though we were public, somebody wanted to buy back all the stock 
because they wanted the technology, not the company. Uh, so the business was ultimately sold uh, to a, a company outside of the country who wanted all the patents and technology licenses. But we had a we had a good run, and that was a lot of fun. It was a great team. Yeah, it was fascinating. I was in Chicago. My company was public yes. same time. Great stuff. Um, so Ubid was the early precursor in kind of you know B two B auction space. Priceline, I think, is a little more known. Like the geeky guys like me will know the Ubids. What what was the motivation or impetus? What did you see as a gap in the market for Priceline, and how did that come about? Sure. So uh, there there is an inventor a guy named Jay Walker. Um, Jay is an IP guy. He had a company called Walker Digital that is constantly looking at industries. And what he'd been doing was creating a lot of patents for business process ideas. And Jay had this idea about the reverse auction, yeah. name your own price, and wanted to patent it. The reason when, when Jay called me, uh, Jay is, in, you know, we kind of, I got to say this, man, we kind of sorted the world into three groups. There are inventors, builders, and operators. Yes. Inventors always think up ideas, but they never actually build anything, right? Builders grab one of those ideas off the table, and by the time they come back, there's 150 employees and you're making money. But then there's operators, because when that company is up and running, the builder wants to grab another idea and build it, and the operator right. will stay and run it. So that's where things were. Jay was the inventor of this yeah. IP, but he said, I, we needed, I, I need to build something. So that's when we created a team of people to actually launch the company. And during that time, we actually launched, I think, five companies. The travel company that people know today was the first one, and it just took off. So it, it became the big one, but we launched five different companies together. Yeah, Priceline as a team. Webhouse. Yeah, we had Webhouse Yard Sale, we had Mod. Webhouse. Yeah, a bunch we had of a couple other products. Walker Digital companies. One was called Retail DNA. So we all together as a group launched a series of companies, but the uh, travel one is the one that, that uh, was the simplest. Honestly, it's pretty simple to launch because unlike Amazon, there's no warehouses, there's no forklifts. Yeah. It was soft goods. and. Part of the reason that Jay came to me is that I came out of travel from building those kiosks and stuff. So I knew the back end of building travel technology. And that's why he kept calling me and saying, I got this idea, come help. Yeah, it was an amazing time because the, the world was being disrupted by the, you know, the internet and new technology and efficiencies and you know, so much latent stuff. So Priceline was there, there was a reverse auction for, for the people that know. And then booking.com came a little bit later. Wasn't Correct. that an amalgamation? Yeah, and that was uh, really what that was about was what is the fast, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a growth strategy, right? You have an organic growth, which Priceline was achieving quickly, uh, but there was a group that had already started to spread the online booking concept um, in Europe, uh, which was nowhere near, I don't think, as, you know, at the, at the, the sort of speed of expansion of Priceline, but that's what's booking, uh, was already getting that foothold. And there was a Goda over in the Asian market. And the idea was uh, to uh, acquire their head start and roll those all into one company uh, so that we could be in the OTAs, as they call them, online travel agencies. Uh, so the Priceline could be the first company to really plant its flag in Europe and in Asia. So that's what that strategy was. And then after booking.com, what came next? Because I know there's an arc that we're trans transitioning through here. Yeah, well, there actually was one before that. Um, uh, so we had a, a private company that we were, um, that we did a deal was a, a private entity called, we called it Worldspan, uh, that a partner of mine, uh, Mike and I did. And that's where we were building the technology for airlines. That's where we started the online booking technology. And we did a deal with Bill Gates and Microsoft and my team built Expedia uh, in partnership with Microsoft. So we were in that, um, I was part of that as well, where, where we did that deal with, with Microsoft and we built Expedia. Um, I had one though I gotta throw in there because there was a point before that in the nineties where I thought to myself, do you really need to drive to the mall to buy a sweater? You have a computer, you have a modem. <laughs> Can't you just go online and order it and they'll ship it to you? So I started a company uh, that was uh, called Virtual Shopping, trying to think of a consumer friendly name. Uh, we built technology to enable you to buy stuff from home 
using this really cool new technology called the internet. It was not new. In reality, it was new to the consumer world. And we launched, built the company, launched it, and it was crickets chirping silence because nobody was comfortable putting their credit card into a website at the start of the internet. So I actually had a fail. We tried to launch an internet shopping company too early and that company failed. It, it, there was something that rose from the ashes, uh, which is I did another company right after that called Compute Bank. I'm talking about a stupid name. We were the first, but we got the first, and we were the first internet bank ever licensed in the US from the OCC, from the Office of the Controller of the Currency. We got the first license for a bank that had no physical uh, branches, no sure. office at all. And it was almost comical because the controllers kept calling and saying, all right, what's the address? We have to come out and inspect your bank. And we're like, there is no bank. It's on the internet. And they're like, OK, well, exactly DNS where address. do we find this internet? 192.1.81. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> round and round, they kept saying, well, we can't put it into GPS if you don't tell us where you are. Yeah. Um, so we had, I had a couple other pieces, but post Priceline and booking is when I uh, took a break to, honestly, why I did this, Stephen, was I wanted to, Hollywood is the world's ultimate marketing machine. And I wanted to sharpen my marketing skills. So that's when I took a break from tech and got into media and entertainment. I launched my entertainment company post Priceline uh, and the internet bubble had crashed and people didn't want to new, do a lot of internet stuff in that yeah. short space of time. So I went into media then. Interesting. Let's go, let's go backwards for a minute and then go forward. The virtual company, what year was that? That was in, I'm going to guess, 95, 96, I was trying that. Funny. So we'll, we'll talk offline. The company I had in Chicago, I took public in 99, was called Virtual Sellers. Uh, and we had the globe with a shopping cart going around it. So the shopping cart logos today. Yeah. Yeah. So ours, mine was called Virtual Sellers. And it was the same thing. We built shopping carts for people selling online, did the order processing, never touched fulfillment. Oh, my gosh. That's... Yeah. But 99, it works. 96, I was too early. Well, that's, and I we started March of 96, and Visa shut me down in August for illegally doing credit card orders. And I had to convince them I was an 800 service, not an internet provider. Because to your point, they said the internet will never work. People won't put their yeah. credit cards online. You know, there's, and again, I won't digress much. I'll send you a link. Uh, Jeff oh, yeah, I would love I, to see that. We were interviewed on TV.com in 1997. And I joke with Jeff, I got interviewed before him because we were virtual sellers. We were doing products. He was the bookstore, Amazon. And the whole segment was about people will never shop online. Yep. Uh, oh my gosh, that, I, I love, absolutely love that. Uh, you know, the, the funny conversation I had with Bezos back then was about forklifts. Because when I asked him how it's going, he said, well, I got to build warehouses, yeah. right? fill them with books, get forklifts, move books around, get trucks to deliver them. And we were like, we sell travel, there's no forklifts. There's um, no so we were talking about uh, operational efficiency and margins yeah. back then because it took them a long time to get up to profitable. And it turned out that Priceline got profitable really fast without the infrastructure cost. Totally agree. And then again, we'll move forward. What made Amazon profitable was when Werner Vogels launched AWS, which is oh, cloud yeah. service with no product. Once they finally yeah. win no product, then they made money. You know, it's funny because when you were doing the shopping carts, back then I ran into uh, uh, Ch John Chambers. Yeah. And he said something that kept me up at nights only because I wish I'd thought of it. He said when he was uh, launching Cisco, he said, I don't really care who sells what or who buys what. I'm just going to be the pipe between you. And be I was like, well, crap, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> Yeah, don't, he said, I'll don't get paid anytime anybody buys or sells anything. I don't care what you guys do. Well, and that's almost what Priceline did. You, you know, you yeah. guys didn't own planes. You just you didn't care where anybody was going. You make money in the middle. Yeah. All right, let's move forward to entertainment because I'm in Beverly Hills a lot. Entertainment's a whole different animal. What was your interest in the the entertainment and the media and the marketing side there? It's funny that you say that because what really started it was a movie. And there was a movie coming out and everybody was talking about it. And we were all excited. And we went the Friday night it came out. We waited outside in a line for a long time, paid, you know, obviously a lot of money for popcorn and stuff. 
went in there and seven minutes into the movie, I said, this movie sucks. What am I doing here? Why on earth did I leave work early Friday and stand in a line to see this crap? And yeah. the answer is because Hollywood is so good at marketing that they got me excited. They drove me there. So I was like, I need to figure out how they do this so I can be better at marketing. And so when I got into entertainment, my goal was to dig, dig a little deeper into marketing. And the first uh, group that I got involved in, I started a production company to do tours and concerts. And, and we produced tours, we produced concerts, we produced charity events. But one of the first groups I was working with uh, was NSYNC uh, back then. And NSYNC, the same group of people, this was Johnny Wright and, 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 and uh, you know, there were uh, a, a David Zedek, this uh, company called Evolution, Wright Entertainment Group. The team that was launching NSYNC, Backstreet Boys and Britney Spears was the team that I joined and was working with this group. And we did a Britney Spears tour, et cetera. And they were brilliant marketers, right? They created this massive tsunami around things like NSYNC and, and uh, Britney Spears and Backstreet Boys. So being in the middle of that, I actually was, you know, went on tour with them for a while, uh, enabled me to see firsthand uh, a lot of the tricks of the consumer marketing machine. I say tricks and make it sound bad. They're not bad. They're just super innovative marketing it's people. Psychological jujitsu. It's emotional sound bites. They're it, exactly. They were good at it. So I spent time in that space learning it. And did we like I said we did tours like like that? Worked with NSYNC, Britney Spears, Elton John, and I uh, did concert production. I just got into the business. Two reasons. One, I just love music, and I needed a break. I needed to work the right side of my brain and not the left side all day. So I walked away from tech to refresh and reset and load my brain with new ideas, but also because I wanted to see how it was they were so good at marketing and you just hit the nail on the head. It's because they understood emotional response marketing. Yeah. yeah. So I learned living a lot. A, live, living in LA now, I, it's, it's emotional sound bites, it's psychological jujitsu, it's, you know, you it, it. it's learning to tell a story and then Hollywood's the best at storytelling. Absolutely. And, and that is, you know, probably if there's one skill I've personally tried to work on, which I think is, I never set out to be a speaker, right? When people say, are you a professional speaker? I say, no, I, I'll go on a stage and talk, but I just talk about stuff. I don't really give speeches per se. But I started doing that because I understood the immense value and power of storytelling yeah. in, in any business, let alone in life. So Speaking was a way for me to work on storytelling skills, which are extremely valuable when you're selling a product. Absolutely, and that's that. Selling is all storytelling. It's all yep. It's all branding and, and positioning. Um, and so then, entertainment led you to let's let's move through the arc because the sure. the last couple so, of years I've so, seen you on on some oh, of the ahead. speeches and stuff. Go ahead. Yeah. So. Uh, that was a good experience. Um, the, the music business went well because we were during doing pop during the pop time. And, uh, you know, I know, you know, but uh, we produced a jazz album. We won a Grammy for it. Um, uh, and that's so that just was kind of a fun end. I still have the music company. We're not currently producing any concerts or tours. We did some different things over the years. Um, like, for example, today, uh, uh, you know, I, I, some business uh, people, the singer is a business partner and, and friend of mine. We've got some projects going. So I'm still around the music business uh, because of the things Pitbull and I do together. Um, but then I went into television for the same reason, to understand the creative process of storytelling. Uh, we produced a couple of shows. We produced one that's called Success in the City that's redefining success for today's generation. And uh, actually proud of the, our team to say that we won an Emmy for that show. Um, wow. We have one, Stephen, I want to mention that comes out on November 30th. It's a new show called Going Public. I'm a, one of the executive producers, but also starring in the show. Going Public is like Shark Tank, except that the TV viewers get to invest in the companies, not the sharks. Instead of you watching Mark yeah. Cuban get richer, uh, you can buy the pre-IPO stock at a pre-IPO price. Now funding so, on equity using the, the television as a platform. Absolutely. And we are, what best we can tell, the first uh, show. It took two years to get full SEC and FINRA and everybody else yep. full approval to do Reggae Plus Well, under the Jobs TV. Act. The Jobs Act that passed in yep. 2012 enables this kind of activity. Correct. Exactly. And it didn't before. 
Correct. But we still needed a lot of uh, clearances to do it on television. Sure. Because uh, that had a set of rules. So, and then we took a little break to make a, uh, I also wanted to see the creative storytelling process of filmmaking. So started a production company and we made a couple horror flicks. <laughs> that was kind of a fun process. Uh, uh, one of my, he's like a little brother, one of my friends at least went to film school. It's a guy named Eli Roth. And so Eli and I, he'd never made a movie. I'd never made a movie. We wrote, shot, project, project, excuse me, produced, financed, distributed. We basically made a home movie, a scary flick called Cabin Fever. But we got it to open. It's on Hulu. It's on Netflix now. It opened in thousands of theaters. And I oh. was able to get it sold in 49 different countries. So that was the run through the media biz. Okay. And now, talk to us about where you are now, what you have going on, and, and what the future holds for Jeff Hoffman. Sure. So now my biggest focus is on, and the events that you and I run into each other at, that's what I'm there for. My biggest focus is on teaching the mindset and skill set of entrepreneurship to as many people as I can. And so we've created a few entities to do that. Uh, but the one that takes most of my time is called the Global Entrepreneurship Network uh, that I'm currently the chairman of. We're now on the ground and very proud of our team. We just hit 200 countries. I don't even know how many countries there are. Um, we're on the ground in 200 countries with a simple mission statement to teach anyone anywhere how to launch a business. And, and so we provide ecosystem, infrastructure, education, mentoring, financing, anybody that wants to achieve freedom in whatever country they live in, or economic independence through entrepreneurship, has an idea, doesn't know how to launch a company, that's what we teach. Um, that's uh, the event we hold a Global Entrepreneurship Congress that I want you to come to this time. It's uh, in Riyadh in the spring. Uh, we have entrepreneurs from 180 countries that come to that. We just finished Sunday our Global Entrepreneurship Week where we asked people all over the, the world to hold events that celebrate entrepreneurs. We had 190 countries participate. There were 40,000 events and 10 million people attended. So Global Entrepreneurship Network is my focus on trying to teach the skill set of entrepreneurship. So we can't help all the people we want to help. Let's teach them how to help themselves. That's the ripple effect. And one other thing, I also spend a lot of time in my youth charity, which is called World Youth Horizons, which has also a very simple mission statement. Uh, there are children all over the world living a, a, a really horrendous life. And the only way out of it is education. But before we can educate them, we need to get them somewhere safe. We need to get them fed. We need to get them housed and, housed and healthy. So at World Youth Horizons, uh, we build schools, we build homes, orphanages. Uh, we provide health care, uh, basic needs, literally shoes, food, and medicine, and clothes. And then we get them all in schools. We do this in Uganda and Ethiopia and the US. And uh, that's probably the best part of my day uh, when we're dealing with children around the world that would otherwise not have a shot at a better life if they weren't somewhere safe, healthy, and getting educated. Yeah, let's, uh, in, in the few minutes we have left, let's go back for the educational one, the entrepreneur one. What's the program and process in those different countries? Is it online is it a a, a a person on ground classes sure. how do you do that to be so distributed sure so it's all of the above we have spent the last decade collecting and building entrepreneurial content um, which is everything from training courses master classes research every kind all the content that we could collect that we make available online uh, to entrepreneurs all over the world. So we have a huge database and online network of content. But in each of these countries, we have people on the ground that hold live events, including mentoring. We put together both mentor networks and angel investor networks all over the world so that they have people in their country that they can meet with physically. We help coordinate all that so that they can get mentors and they can get investors and they can go to live events. That's, you know, you pre-COVID, there were a lot of times I'd be in a different country every week because I'm actually going out there teaching these classes in a lot of countries. So that's what our team does. We provide local events and local access to mentors and investors, and we provide online content as well. Wow, very cool. And then for the charity with the children, 
what's what's the process for that how do you pick you know locations because they're it's like the starfish story there's a million starfish yeah, on the yeah. beach you can help one you at know, a time perfect analogy because we can't help everybody we want to help right you know the, the other but part you of the can't help that one mother Teresa's quote she said if you can't feed 100 people then feed one yeah um and that's just like that starfish story so most of them are people that I either encountered myself traveling in a lot of these countries or somebody because I do a lot of stuff either on stage or on television and you know my heart is really about helping children in the world people hear that uh, and so a lot of times it's just people that reach out to us and you asked about criteria criteria is you know pretty much I hate to say it, but it's frequently children whose lives might be in danger without us, right? Literally, if, if somebody, I, I, my, my uh, whiteboard is covered because I was doing a live national television recently, but back behind me is, are my four words I live by, uh, Stephen. It says, there is no they. Uh, they don't save the world and they don't feed those kids, you do. So yeah. when these people reach out to us and they're, criteria is this really is pretty much life and death for these children the kids in the school in ethiopia that we helped build they were living in sewers under the streets of ethiopia and dying from the bacteria the dirty water and the lack of food so these kids are now housed clothed fed healthy and they're in school so that's our criteria one last piece of the criteria is that uh, we focus on organizations where we take zero percent overhead Everybody that works for us as part of World Youth Horizons is a volunteer. So 100% of your money, of our money, goes directly to these organizations. So we vet them out heavily to make sure that the money actually goes to building a school yeah. or, an or to food. And we track all that. If anybody wants to learn more, uh, you know, or even donate, it's just worldyouthhorizons.com. So worldyouthhorizons.com. Yeah, right, Jeff. For the next for the next couple of years, what do you see coming up that you're most excited about? Is it the or is it all of the above? Is it the speaking, the entrepreneur, the the charity making a difference? It, it's you know I I would say there is one answer, and it's 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 that I am very hopeful for this next generation. Uh, their values, their leadership style. I had I had an afternoon. <laughs> a uh, better part of a day uh, unexpectedly that I wound up spending the day with the Dalai Lama. And I didn't have questions prepared. And I said to him, what's your best advice? And he said, Jeff, you'd think that if you want to change the world, you need to go talk to the people running it. He said, you're wasting your time. He said, let the world leaders of today die off and spend all your time preparing our youth to lead in a way that's better than the way our generation did it. That is what I'm hopeful about. I meet young people all over the world and I visit schools and we literally visit villages and there's a whole generation of young people that are ready to lead, ready to change the world, ready to focus on values and experiences, not titles and houses and cars. They care less about what they make than they do about what impact they have. And that actually is what gets me up every morning. I'm excited about working with youth in all of our programs. There, there's a synergy there, Jeff, and an alignment with you and I that you don't know about. You'll find out. Uh, we have a product we're launching for the environment. It saves water, plastic, power, pollution, and money. Has a character that becomes a superhero and wants to change the world, but needs to recruit 10 million friends. And, and my friends oh, like, wow. Stephen, you love the environment. It's great. I said, I don't care about the environment. I said, I want a million kids to grow up believing they can change the world. Yes. And be superheroes and maybe one of them will. I said, I don't think I can, but if I can empower I, a million kids to think they can, one of them that. might. It's all about mindset and attitude. Yeah, and just teaching them one X at a time, one action and give them that belief. So Jeff, been an absolute pleasure. I mean, a, amazing history, but I'm, I'm more excited for the next 15 or 20 years in front of you than the things you've done in the past, uh, because you, you really got a shot to make a, a big difference. So appreciate your time Thank on you, this thanks so much thank you yeah. so much for having me i appreciate the time all right Stephen, me the bullseye guy thanks so much tune in again next week